And let's look at a little bit more, uh, dive into, you know, what are, what is the rates, uh, what are the rates of financial literacy uh, in America? So financial literacy among Americans has been steadily declining. And this is according to the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, Foundation. Uh, they did a national financial capability study. And the rate of financial literacy for Americans fell from 42% to 34% between 2009 and 2018. What's interesting is despite the fact that over 70% of Americans self-report being highly financially literate. So there's this kind of measure challenge. And um, in, in the brief, uh, they break down the statistics in terms of what are the levels of debt, planning, how people view planning, maybe the gender, race, division. So we'll walk through that. Nicole, we'll talk a little bit about the depth here um, that's presented in the brief. Do you want me to read this section? Yeah, or... just read the depth section. Sure. Yeah. So the National yeah. Financial uh, Capability Study found that almost 80% of Americans have at least one of six types of debt, including credit card balances, mortgages, auto loans, student loans, unpaid medical bills, or non-bank loans, such as those from government or payday loans. Another 30% of Americans have three or more of these types of debt simultaneously. These rates have remained fairly uh, constant since 2012. And um, when it comes to planning, you know, according to the U.S. Federal Reserve, less than 40 percent of non-retired American adults believe their savings are on track for a secure retirement. And a full 25 percent of Americans have no retirement savings at all. And, and this is when our Social Security uh, may be bankrupt in 2030. Um, over half of the respondents in the National Financial Capability Study indicated that they have not even tried to determine how much they would need to save for retirement. And long-term planning may be a burdensome endeavor, but Americans do not fare much better in the short term. The Federal Reserve found that 30% of U.S. adults would not be able to cover three months of expenses by any means, and 43% of American families would not be able to cover $400 emergency expense without borrowing or selling a possession. Only 49% of respondents do the to the financial uh, capability study indicated that they have three months worth of emergency fund. And, but this is an improvement from the 35% in 2009, but still just barely half of the respondents. So that is, that is an issue in terms of thinking long-term, and it's really hard. It's hard to imagine what you will need and, and to really think about life in, uh, in, in retirement or, or later in life of what you will need. So, um, Nicole, do you, do you want to go over the gender difference? Sure. So a study by Charles Schwab found that parents are more likely to emphasize budgeting with their daughters and investing with their sons. This gender gap extends throughout life and greatly affects women's financial confidence. Women are more likely than men to feel anxious about finances, and only 35% of women have even tried to determine how much money they will need to retire. In fact, only 17% of American women between the ages of 60 to 75 passed a retirement income literacy survey from the American College of Financial Services. Of women aged 65 and older in 2007, 13.9% of widows, 15.8% of divorced women, and 21.5% of ne never married women had total incomes below the official poverty threshold compared to 4.3% of married women. Yeah, and maybe I'll, I'll just repeat that that section um, just because you said 2007. So I'll just repeat that section. Oh, did I? Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I'll just repeat it. Um, so of women aged 65 and older in 2017, 13.9% of widows, 15.8% of divorced women, and 21.5% of never marrying women had total incomes below the official poverty threshold compared to 4.3% of married women women I find uh, this this gender difference in financial acumen and financial readiness is, is surprising since women are so risk adverse and feel anxious about finances yet they're not 
numbers shows that they're not taking the measures to really be ready and, and take ownership of the finances. Do you have like some thoughts there around the gender difference, Nicole? Yeah. Um, I, I can't really explain it. Um, I think that I just, I, I, it is interesting to me as well. Um, I, I just want to emphasize how important it is, uh, in this day and age to, for, you know, if you're in a relationship, um, you know, both parties in that relationship need to be, uh, open and transparent about, their finances and, and either partner should, should feel, uh, confident and, uh, compelled to fully understand the picture. And I think, um, you know, as I, as I'm reading this one thing that kind of com comes to mind is estate planning and, and things of that nature. And, the, and policy does play a role here. Certain States treat different est estates differently, depending on what happens. And if you don't have a a will put in place. And, and those conversations are important, not only for, you know, what happens when you're gone from this earth, but you really need to understand, are, is your family taken care of? Are your kids taken care of? And so, um, you know, having some basic financial knowledge can help you get there to make sure, you know, gee, if unfortunately, if I had to, if I left this planet, is everything okay? And I think in order to really understand that you just need to, um, you know, be educated on, on some of the terminology. Goes, yeah. And I think it goes back also to the story we told at the beginning about having these conversations with your parents. I think it's the same kind of stigma or hesitation to have these really open conversation about finances with, with your partner in the end, you know, the number of stories I hear of people getting married and, and realizing that their partner comes with a really big student loan and how are they going to manage that, uh, together as a, as a surprise, it's kind of, you know, this is the kind of conversation as you're entering in a, in a relationship and, and deciding to, to, um, to go on your life journey with someone you need to be really, uh, open and candid about and transparent, as you said, to use your words. And, and goes back to being comfortable talking about money. And it also goes back to women being comfortable talking about uh, how much they're making, ra asking for raise, pursuing career that will lead to strong financial stability as well. It, it kind of all ties together, I think. Um, you know, the other underlying thing here that I suspect might be happening is the breadwinner in the relationship really having uh, more more of a, of a say or just having more control over things. And I would just encourage like, it is an equal, this is just Klein commentary here, but it's an equal partnership. And um, really just regardless of who the breadwinner is, you, you know, um, oftentimes, and, and as I look back at my, how my parents manage finances, my dad um, was the breadwinner but my mom still managed the finances and had like the day-to-day -day operations of paying the bills and the checkbook and kind of planning out what their, their retirement looks like. So, you know, it's an equal partnership and regardless of whether who's making more or less, it, it just needs to be transparent to, for you to understand. So I think that might be an underlying thing here yeah. of why what's going yeah, on. Absolutely. So there's another uh, section here in the, in the brief on, on just race, you know, mm -hmm. blacks 41% mm -hmm. and Hispanic 38% respondents to this national financial capability study were more likely to report having trouble in covering unexpected expenses compared to white respondents at 27%. In the 2019 Personal Finance Index from the Teachers Insurance and Annuity Association of America and George Washington University, white participants answered 55% of the questions correctly, whereas black participants answered 38% of the questions correctly. Uh, this gap remains after controlling for other socioeconomic factors, such as gender, education, marital status, and household income. So that is another, another factor to, to just take into consideration. One thing that's not mentioned in the brief, and my reaction was, I wonder what are the rates with immigrants, with, with immigrant population here in the U.S., because it, it is also something it's getting more and more complex, uh, personal finance and the choices that you have to make that are available to you as well. Uh, and I wonder what that number is or, you know, where that analysis would be uh, for immigrants or non-native English speakers. Um, I, I wonder where it is. So 
That's yeah, definitely. That would be that would be good to include. Yeah. Um, so, Nicole, did you want to tell us students take the next? Sure. So, student loan debt is the second largest debt category behind mortgage debt and higher than both credit card and auto loans. In the U.S., close to 45 million borrowers owe over 1.5 trillion with a T in student uh, in student loans. Across income levels, about 44% of national financial capability study respondents, which are ages 18 to 34, have student loans they need to repay. Of those, 42% had been late with a payment at least once that year, and 48% expressed concern about being unable to pay off their student loans. Older cohorts also face the stressor, stressors of debt. In fact, the federal student loan portfolio shows that 35 to 49 age group owes more than 25 uh, owes more than the 25 to 34 age group, demonstrating that repaying loans can be a burden that remains well into years when people are having uh, children and, and buying homes, which is something that we talked about earlier. Yeah, and that's right. I mean, the student loan, and I think we are recording this in the middle of this global pandemic, and uh, we're families are really reconsidering the value that they are getting uh, for what they pay to uh, to go to college. And I think this will be a, a really, it's a big consideration uh, now in, uh, in today's environment as to whether or not we want to carry this level of debt for not necessarily uh, the, the income level that we would expect from spending that much on, uh, on an education. 